Thank you, folks. Hope you had a great lunch. So I want to touch on a couple real-world data points, and then we're going to leap into talking about data. So Helen Fagan talked about Iran. Around the time she was 12, I was about age 8, and I was watching it on a black and white television in Philadelphia. Fast forward a few years to 1989, I was on active duty as an intel analyst. While I was on active duty, one of the things I learned about was an OODA loop. And it turns out an OODA loop is observe, orient, decide, and act. Kind of like right now, I'm observing and orienting my hands and deciding when to throw and catch. And you're hoping, you're wondering how long this is going to go on, right? <laughs> so we're going to do one more little trick here real quick. And if I had sneakers on, we could do a few more, but we're going to stop there. So data is all about observing the real world, orienting where we are in the real world, making decisions about it, so decision support systems you might hear about in industry, and then taking actions. It's the same stuff that started in the Defense Department with fighter pilots uh, post-Vietnam War, and they wanted to know how to fight better, and that's where OODA loops came out of. So it turns out that mo many people in this room, or people they know, were dealing with something known as the Missouri River Flood of 2011 last year. One of the challenges with the flood is that there was a lot of information coming out. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Federal Emergency Management Agency, American Red Cross, national media, social media. There was a gap, though, with respect to how can we better leverage the social value of this data. So a friend of mine, Bill Susan, and I launched a site called MightyMoRiver.com. You can go there now on your phone or iPad or whatever. And basically the idea was to draw this information in, some of it automated, some of it manual curation, and actually stick it on a map, give people a timeline to work with. They could drill down by categories. And for instance, here's one report. How many of you recognize this building? Shelton Fireworks, I-29, heading to Kansas City. So last year, it looked something like this. If you went down there this year, like I did one time, it's pretty dry. We're in a drought this year. This is an example report, though. It was actually taken by Tiff Holmes, Tiff Holmes' photo on Twitter. She's from this area. Her and her brother took a lot of pictures and we're posting them to collect benefits. We integrated with her work into our site. The idea, though, throughout the entire project was the social value of data. We didn't really, until the end of the project, start really thinking about the financial value of this data. That started happening when the uh, Nebraska Business Development Center put together a uh, conference, if you will, local businesses, because there is recovery that we needed to think about. So how do we uh, have company, how do we advise companies on bidding against federal bids, state bids, local bids? Where do they find out what's going on? And so we actually started working with them a little bit on this and then started thinking even more about the financial value of data. A couple of quick notes on this project. Hurricane Irene happened in Vermont. We actually got a call to help them get their instance stood up. The Mumbai bombings, you may recall, in India. We also helped a couple of folks over there. So basically, Ushahidi is WordPress for disaster response. Lots of social value with respect to data. Delving into financial value, though, switch topics here. How many of you are familiar with health insurance? Pretty much all of us, right? All of us care about this. And it's been in the news, it's in the presidential debates, all those sorts of things. Very simple model here, folks. We have individuals. Most of us care about having access to care. Then we have providers that we go to see, carriers that we pay money to sometimes, and our employers pay them money as well. And then, of course, all the different governing bodies, whether it's government or different licensing agencies. In practice, though, these links that you see look something more like this with respect to data and with respect to money. Money, though, for a moment, we're going to take it actually off the table. Why are we going to do that? I don't care where you sit in here. Somewhere money is green or red, depending on your perspective, right? But in practice, when we start thinking about changing the dynamic in the system, money turns out to be a common denominator. And what do we do with common denominators? Grade school stuff, what do we do with them? Take them out. So we're going to take money right off the table for a moment. Instead, we're going to talk about incentives. What is my incentive as an individual? My incentive as an individual, first and foremost, is access to care. I've been in government for 12 years, industry for about eight. I've been in academia for a few as well. Switched carriers a lot of times in that process. So when I'm switching carriers, one of the first things that I want to do as an individual is go to the carrier's site and look up my providers and find out if they're there. Some carriers don't do a very good job, though, of maintaining that database on their site. What's happening there? They're losing money. Yes, but why are they losing money? Because they're not playing to my incentive. My incentive is that access to care. 
What's another incentive? Let's talk about a big one, employers and wellness. Fundamentally, what do employers care about with respect to their employees? They want them to be happy when they come in and happy when they come home, when they go home. If they have stress at home, they want to understand that and perhaps provide them services to manage it. And if there's stress at work, they want to help them manage that. They want to keep those costs low, both for themselves and their employees. For about 20 years now, we've had something that I like to call U Wellness, which for, has worked very well. Lincoln Industries here in town is one of the best wellness programs in the nation. They're often cited for this. What happens in these programs? We have surveys. Maybe once a year you fill out and you say, well, am I divorced or not? Am I drunk or, you know, am I alcoholic or not? Uh, what, what other stressors exist in my life? You get a report back that some, will say something like, you should get counseling and you should try a patch. Good stuff, but it's not in anywhere near real time, and it's certainly not anywhere near, well, what maximum value could I be getting out of that? Well, we're now in a little bit different age, something I like to call eye wellness. I can wear a Fitbit, a Nike Fuel armband, lots of other gadgets exist that can monitor my health. I can also carry a smartphone. And a good friend of mine, Sam Ramji out at Apogee, reminded me, we're projected to have one billion devices, not dollars, smartphone devices in use by 2014. Essentially saying, OK, the world of dumb phones is perhaps evaporating very, very soon. If we can couple those smartphones with those smart devices, we can suddenly start doing things that change the dynamic with respect to health care. If we take that to an extreme for a moment, we end up with something called the quantified self. Quantified self is all about I'm monitored in real time, not just with respect to biometrics and a Fitbit, but everything I see, everything I hear, can be captured and processed. Somewhere between one end of you wellness with surveys and I wellness with quantified self, somewhere in there is a lot of data that can be better used to change the dynamics of the healthcare insurance industry. To put it in a, to use an analogy, uh, the auto industry back in the 1960s. Detroit was very focused on how can we essentially treat people as objects and manage them directly. Japan, on the other hand, viewed those same people as sources of data and active users in the system of that data. That's where we get things like Tiger Teams from. If we start looking at health care insurance that way, where we, the individuals, are not objects to be managed with respect to costs, but rather participants in a dynamic system, in fact, there's a whole field of study called system dynamics for this, then we can start better leveraging the data in the healthcare system. And once we've done that, and once we've understood people's incentives with, throughout that system, then yeah, money comes back into the equation. We can figure out how to save costs. But if you start with thinking about the money, just like many other challenges in life, you don't really get anywhere very often. So you take that off the table for a moment, think about the system, think about the incentives. So say you've done that. Say you say, OK, Chris, we've taken the money off the table, and we've got this pile of data in front of us. Well, one of the challenges that you run into in data mining, which is my field, uh, take a mountain. You want to go out to the Sierra Nevada. You're going to go mine for some gold. You're going to go perhaps mine for some oil if you're in Iran. One of, the ha one of the things that happens in the real world is that that stuff is co-located. Once you find the mother load, you can go along the mother load, and you can keep finding more gold. Or once you find an oil deposit, well, there's an oil deposit, and you keep working it. In data mining, it's more like someone took the mountain, ran it through a giant shredder, spit it out, put a pile in front of you, and said, now go do something. So one of the first challenges in data mining is to put the mountain back together, and then you can go find the value in there. So for instance, what's, what's one thing to think about assuming you've done that? Let's talk about dimensions. Many of you are tweeting about TEDx throughout today. Anytime you send out a tweet, I know where, who, and when. Where is optional, optionally, technical, optional technically. I also often have media attached to it, a picture, a video file, those sorts of things. When, you're, when you have a business person in the room, and you have a tech person in the room, and you have your customer in the room, and I don't care if it's at the individual level, you know, say you're at home talking about well, how are you going to do things in your life versus at work, one of the first things to understand is what data do you have and what data should you go get? The next big question that I think you should tackle is scale. So for instance, if we take all the TEDx tweets, if we take all the presidential debate tweets, suddenly we can start doing things like sentiment analysis. What are, what are people really saying from a tone perspective? 
What are their topics? What are their categories? To illustrate that visually, there's two famous pictures. The pale blue dot, taken 30, 40 years ago, and the blue marble, which has actually been updated a few times. Both of them are lots of data about Earth, but taken from two very different perspectives. The top one, the pale blue dot, Earth is actually less than half a pixel inside of that red circle there. I can understand where Earth sits in the solar system. The blue marble lets me look at the, what's going on on Earth. Still lots of data, but at two different scales, and it's two different types of data. So when you're sitting there in a business meeting and you're like, well, Chris, we've got this data, and this is what it is, and when it's at this scale, understanding that is what drives what you can pull out of it from a business perspective. So say you've figured that out. Now what do you do with it? Um, this is sort of the, the main point that I want you to take away today. If you're an individual, many people balk at the idea of participating in social media, for instance, because, well, that data is public, and everyone's going to know what I tweeted. Or the same thing with their health data. Many people are going to know all my records. That's true. You're going to get relinquish some privacy. But thinking back to your incentive, what they should be offering you is value in return. And that's the, the question you should be making sure is answered. So don't just balk simply because you're giving up data. Same is true on the company side of things. Many companies think about, well, this is proprietary data that we really need to hold on to. Well, look at LinkedIn. A lot of that stuff is out there publicly. You participate, you get it. They figured out how to monetize it. They figured out, just like you go from gold to jewelry, how to go from giving you time delayed like data in the stock exchange, for instance, you can go get that for free, all the way through making you pay for analytics. LinkedIn, recruiters pay for access to the data. So you, a company, deal with data, think about that. And if you do it correctly, you'll move from some pile of bits to being able to be Tony Stark and say, I just pulled all this data out of my dad's description of the World's Fair. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time, and have a great day at TEDxLincoln. <laughs>